Jesus as a historical figure is controversial. There's people that say yes, there's historical documents that show he existed. And then there's a bunch of documentaries that you can watch that like, boy, the, the evidence is kind of sketchy. It seems to be a thought, uh, like a recurring thing in many religions. It seems to be like Hercules, right? It seems to be there's a bunch of these that are like real similar to that, like the child of a god. The gospels that are written about Jesus were written after, right? Not during. And that was, you know, common. I mean, Socrates never wrote anything down. He told right. the stories to Plato. And, and how long after his death? Well, I think the first one, now I feel like I, I am not um, a historian here, but I think the first one was like 100 years. And so you have Apostle Paul who wrote, but he only saw Jesus after, like he was on the road to Damascus. And so he saw Jesus after Jesus had been crucified and risen. So what he saw was a ghost of Jesus. But the other, you know, gospels were not written by anyone who had seen Jesus in that way, even though they were the versions like of when you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the versions that they were told. So I don't know, maybe a hundred years. There's really two pieces to this opening conversation that they've had that I want to address in this video. The first, and basically by address, I mean debunk. The first layer to this is the idea that Jesus did not exist in history. We're gonna absolutely close the case on that. Then the second layer is, okay, maybe he did exist, but the supernatural elements, some of the claims about his life evolved over time. There was a gap between when these things were recorded and when these things occurred in history. And during that gap, the, the stories basically grew and took on a mythological nature. So we're gonna address both of these layers in this video. We're gonna begin first with the first part here. Did Jesus actually exist? And in order to do that, it's gonna be Nabil Qureshi who does a great job in a few brief minutes of explaining that. Let's do it. Where is there proof outside of the Bible um, that Jesus existed, the history of Christ and who he was? And I said there were writings out there, but I wasn't really sure what they were, so if you could. That's a good question, but it's also somewhat wrongheaded. Um, wow, I sounded like a politician there for a moment, or I sounded like a boss giving a, uh, a report. Anyway, um, it is a good question, but it is somewhat wrongheaded because the Bible is not one book. You've got 39 Old Testament, perhaps more if you're Catholic. You've got 27 New Testament. <laughs> and, you know, so to, to treat it all as if it were just unallowable evidence is kind of short-sighted because the people who were not Christian, were not followers of Jesus, the moment they believed him to be risen, they became followers of Jesus, like Paul. And so if you're going to cut out everyone like that's testimony, that's everyone who has one position, even though they're coming from all these different backgrounds. So that's the first thing I would say. It's, it's not quite a fair way to treat the evidence. But there is plenty of evidence outside of the New Testament. Uh, for more on this, go to the work of Gary Habermas. He has a book called Historical Jesus. I believe it's free on his website, GaryHabermas.com. Um, but he lists all the extra-biblical records of Jesus in, in the New Testament. Uh, I'm sorry, outside of the New Testament. Um, so, for example, Pliny the Elder, right? Pliny's writing a letter to Trajan. Uh, it's in book 10 of his epistles. And as he's writing a letter to them, he says to Trajan, basically he says, look, I've, I've got all these Christians uh, I've been asking them what they do, and they just tell me that they're trying to be good and helping people, but I don't believe them, so I've been killing them. Emperor Trajan, tell me how I'm supposed to do this. Should I be seeking them out and killing them, or should I wait till they come to me? Maybe someone brings them to me. What should I do? In the process of writing this letter, he says that Jesus is worshipped as a god very early on. Um, in other letters, we see things, for example, Lucian of Samosata, we see that in the, in the Talmud, which is a Jewish source, we see um, in Marabar Serapion, um, we see in Tacitus, these are all non-Christian, non-New Testament sources, all of them say Jesus was killed by crucifixion. So that is why scholars like Bart Ehrman, who I mentioned before, like Paula Fredrickson, like Marcus Borg, who I believe recently passed away, all these scholars who are non-Christian can say, we can be certain that Jesus Christ died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Paula Fredrickson even says that this is one of the most certain facts of history. Not just as certain regarding Jesus, it's one of the most certain facts of history because these records are so widespread from so many different people. Not just Christians in the first generation in the New Testament, also Christians outside of the New Testament from the first generation. So read a, a letter like First Clement, which is Christian but not in the New Testament. 
from people who are Gentiles, like Tacitus and Lucian, from people who are Jews, like the Talmud and Marabar Serapi, and you've got, it, you've got a lot of this stuff everywhere. Um, but I, I would be very remiss if I said that you can just toss out the New Testament. It's really not the right way to do history. So let me add one thing to this just to sort of put a final nail in the coffin here. There are four times as many sources for Jesus from Nazareth as there is for Tiberius Caesar, who is the Caesar during the time of Jesus. So in other words, if you're going to throw out Jesus from a historical perspective, you're literally going to have to also throw out the existence of Tiberius Caesar, who was Caesar. And for that matter, you're going to have to throw out all of the rest of the ancient world. It's anti-intellectual, it's anti-historic to take the view that Jesus didn't exist in history. But that's only layer one. But I do want to address that layer because it's shocking how many people, based on these documentaries that Joe Rogan was talking about, actually think that they're that Jesus is just a pure myth, that he wasn't actually in history. So now let's address the second layer to this, though, which is the idea that some of the more supernatural claims, some of the d divine claims, the idea that he was worshipped, the idea that he performed miracles, etc., that these things arose up during this gap of time from when the historic events took place and when the recording of those events took place. So in order to address that, we're going to go now to J. Warner Wallace. He's a cold case detective. You might recognize him from Dateline in BC, and he's using sort of the paradigm that they use in cold case investigation to look at the ancient documents around the life of Jesus. And so here is basically his argument. Let's, let's check it out. How do I know, even if it's written early, that over the years it wasn't corrupted? The, the, the earliest documents are simply Jesus as a simple teacher, a simple Jewish rabbi, and then history turns him into a legend where all of a sudden he's the living son of God who rose from the dead. How do I know it hasn't changed over time? How do I know that in the time between the life of Jesus and the council, somebody, though, didn't change a significant fact about Jesus? We have a similar problem when we do criminal cases. At the crime scene, and we eventually have to go to court. And sometimes it's 32 years, 33 years between the one thing and the other. I'll put a casing in the crime scene. See, I just put it there. I'll put the same casing in the court scene. There it is. See it? Bullet casing. How do I know that that casing at the crime scene is the same casing that's in the courtroom? How do I know that some lying detective didn't insert that in property 20 years after the fact? And because nobody knew any better, that thing got passed off to an unsuspecting criminalist who worked it like it was real evidence and gave it to another detective who didn't know any better and brought it into the courtroom. And now I've got a bad piece of evidence in the courtroom. It shouldn't even be there because it wasn't part of the original crime scene. How do I know? I think something similar could have happened in the, in the Christian story. How do I know that somebody didn't see something at the crime scene, but what we have in court is something different because along the way, 100 years after the fact, some lying author changed the details, and then there's some other unsuspecting Christian after that brought that tainted testimony into the council. A lot of skeptics would like us to believe this is true. Well, I know at the crime scene what I do. I go back and I look and I establish something called the chain of custody. Now, the question, of course, is, is there a similar kind of chain of custody for the New Testament? Is there somebody at the crime scene who took a Polaroid? And I can look at it and see what does it say about Jesus? Turns out there is. I'll give you an example of this. We'll start with the life of Jesus again. Here's the courtroom, Council of Laodicea. And here we have uh, the first uh, guy at the crime scene, John. Takes a Polaroid, but how do I know that it didn't get changed? Well, John gave this to the next officer, who happened to be his student. He had three students, Ignatius, Papias, and Polycarp, who all became leaders in their own right and wrote letters in which they describe what they were taught by John. So we now have a snapshot of what John says, not based on John's gospel, based on the writings of his students who became church leaders in their own right. Ignatius wrote, seven letters that still survive. And in those letters, he's quoting all kinds of New Testament books, including John's gospel. We have a picture of Jesus just from Ignatius. Same thing happens with Papias, but his work is lost to us. He's quoted by Eusebius. I'm just gonna let that go for now. Let's go to Polycarp. One letter survives, and we've got a picture of Jesus as given to him by John, and he quotes a lot of scripture, 14 to 16 books. That's a lot of, of New Testament. Don't think for a second that the New Testament was formed at the Council of Laodicea. The New Testament is already in existence. They're already quoting it. It's just formally recognized at Laodicea. Don't be fooled by this. It's already being quoted early in the second century. They have a student too. 
Both Ignatius and Polycarp had a student named Irenaeus who became a leader in the church and eventually identified what he called the reliable canon. And he identifies 24 books. And when he got to his student, Hippolytus, he reiterates what he's taught by Irenaeus. Unfortunately, Hippolytus was uh, not in favor with the Roman leadership, was exiled to the mines and died in the mines in Italy, and unfortunately has no student that I can locate to see what that student said. But I could do the same chain of custody with each writer. So if I'm looking at what Paul wrote, I've got a chain of custody through Linus and Clement, both mentioned by Paul in their letters, both early church bishops. Clement wrote a letter called First Clement. And I can keep on going down through all these students of Peter through Mark and the North African bishops all the way through Eusebius into the council. So I can follow and take a picture of Jesus along the way to see, has he changed over time? Or is the Jesus we know the same Jesus that was described in the very earliest years? Here's what I find out. If I didn't have the writing of these three guys, Peter, John, and Paul, and all I have was the writing of their students, what would Jesus be look, really look like? He, unfortunately for Bart Ehrman and other skeptics, he'd be the same Jesus we know today, the miracle worker who called himself God who rose from the dead. That's the Jesus that skeptics hate. That's the Jesus they want you to believe has become a legend from the real Jesus who wasn't any of those things. But unfortunately, the earliest eyewitness accounts describe him this way. Okay, so like he said, this can actually be done with any of the Gospels. But let's go to Mark. Let's look at this. Who is Mark? Was Mark actually there at the scene of the crime as... J. Warner Wallace would put it. So first of all, his full name was John Mark, John being the Jewish name, Mark being the Roman name. In Acts 12, 25, it says, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their, their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. So this is the person who worked alongside of Peter, the Peter who lived with Jesus for three years, was a disciple of Jesus. Peter and John Mark were friends, lived together, ministered together, and we're in this early, early church together, proclaiming the message of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, okay? So this is important to understand. Then over a period of about 30 years, they're working on this project. They're working on the writing down of all of the things that they experienced. So Mark is talking to Peter. Peter is saying, oh yeah, there was this other time when Jesus said this, when this happened, when Jesus did this, and Mark is there, writing that down and putting the experiences that Peter had, the things that Peter saw and heard happen himself in his life. John Mark is recording those things down on paper uh, as they're also proclaiming this same message. It's not like there's a hundred year long gap or just a hundred year long period of silence. And then all of a sudden, after everyone's died, this book pops out of uh, out of thin air called the Gospel according to Mark. Scholars understand that Mark was written and really completed at around 65 AD, some say 70 AD. But again, we're talking about 30 years that, not, first of all, not 100 years, but 30 years. And second of all, during that time, they're working on this project of recording it. So is the Gospel of Mark a recollection or a recording of eyewitness account? Yes, it is. Is the chain of custody crystal clear in history as can be corroborated by external sources? Yes, it is. And this is really important to understand. There's a lot more that can be said about this, obviously, but I hope that this gives you guys, I hope you guys can visualize how this went down and how different the real historic record and how it, how it was created is different from the view that a lot of people unfortunately have today and that is, you know, propagated by podcasts like the Joe Rogan Experience, not hating on the Joe Rogan Experience, but because it's so popular and because people hear things on there and a lot of times just accept it as fact, because like Joe himself mentioned, there's a lot of documentaries that kind of go into some of these different conspiracies and kind of go into some of these things that are actually baseless, but provocative and interesting and the hidden gospels and the secret this and the secret that. And there's a lot of different attempts that are made and skepticism, both at a popular level and in scholarship that are attempting to discredit what is actually historically knowable. And so for that reason, I think books like J. Warner Wallace's book, Cold Case, Cold Case Christianity, is important. Um, this is by no means the most scholarly work, but he does a cool job of taking the scholarship, distilling it down, and then putting it into this sort of uh, package that he is familiar with as a cold case detective. What would it look like if you were trying to solve the cold case of 
Christianity. And so we're actually reading this book in the book club. If you guys want to join us in the Wisdom Society, you'll get a chance at the end of this month to actually FaceTime with Jay Warner Wallace himself, ask him questions. Maybe you're a skeptic and you're like, man, I would, I would, <laughs> you know, I really want to let it rip and I really want to tell Jay Warner Wallace why he's wrong. You're still invited. Join us in the book club. The link is in the description. Uh, I hope you guys find value in the book club project. It's been a cool thing for me to string together in order to try and connect you guys as the audience with the guest that I feature on this channel. I hope you enjoy it and see the value in that. There's a lot of other components to it. Just read uh, the link in the description. You'll kind of get the rundown on what the Wisdom Society is. With all of this being said, thank you guys for watching this video. You can tell I'm kind of hyped up on this topic because it's something that I think is so important and that is so extremely misunderstood. So thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please consider joining the Wisdom Society. Support the mission. Invest in yourself. Join the community.